Aloha and welcome to Hawaii, the state of clean energy. I'm your host, Mitch Ewan. Our underwriter is the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, and that's a program of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. You'll see all my brand new uh, background uh, has our logos and everything else on it. I just did that today. So I'm really uh, pleased to welcome our guest and my good friend, uh, Peter Sternlight uh, from Sustainable Energy Hawaii, SEH. So we're going to be talking story today about spaceship Earth, and we have a problem, Houston. So today we're going to define today we're going to define our energy system problems, and we plan to make this one of a first of a series of shows, and the subsequent shows will be talking about solutions because yes, there are solutions. So Peter, uh, welcome to the show. Hey Mitch. And uh, let's throw up uh, the first slide. And I want to talk about the first slide because we're living on spaceship Earth. So the spaceship, uh, so spaceship Earth is just like the, the shuttle. So we're living in a space in, in a in a spaceship. It's called Earth, and with all of its life support systems, and essentially it, it helps us with three things we need to sustain our life. We need food, energy, and water. And today we're going to be focusing on the energy part. So, Peter. Talk to us about energy and your aha moment when you said, wow, Houston, we've got a problem here. Oh, wow. I mean, the aha moment was, God, it, it goes back to the, the first Gulf War. Um, and when I realized that that was all about energy, you know, and, and, right. and what we use for our economy. But um, there have been a number of uh, aha moments, which, um, you know, have been evolving over time. And I guess it was in the early 2000s that I realized that, um, you know, really pragmatically that petroleum was a, a finite resource and that it was intertwined in everything that we do. Um, from there, I got into, you know, realizing that it, it, it's not just petroleum, but it's all natural resources. And it gets compounded with exponential growth of our population and increasing demand and pollution and climate change. And it just, we've, we've, we've done a number here, you know? We have, yeah, and, and finite means it'll run out. And are we ready for when it runs out? Peter, why don't we talk a little bit about sustainability, which is the topic of our next slide. Yeah, I do not think we're ready. I don't think we understand what sustainability is. I mean, we named our organization, our nonprofit Sustainable Energy Hawaii. And I was really hesitant about using the word sustainable um, in the sense that it's such a cliche word. And it's like, mm -hmm. what does it really mean? I mean, people use it like the word clean it. Um, but you, the, the, the definition that, that, that resonates for us at uh, SEH, uh, Sustainable Energy Hawaii, is that it's a means of configuring civil, civilization and human activity so that society, all its members and its economies are able to meet their needs and express their greatest potential in the present while pre preserving biodiversity and natural ecosystems by planning and acting for the ability to maintain these ideals for future generations. It's a long-term vision. So I really want to make the point that renewable and sustainable, renewable energy and sustainability, sustainable energy are really two different things. Yeah, it's really important. And we'll be talking about this uh, today is like not using up all the good stuff for us and then essentially leaving nothing left in the kitty for our kids, grandkids, and even looking way out in the future for future generations. I mean, it's it's the basically the survival of the human species, and also all the other species that inhabit uh, you know spaceship Earth. So let's uh, talk a little bit about you know our extractive um, economic system and the energy system. So uh, next slide, please which is the GDP slide. Yeah, so one of the things I've, I've had the opportunity to get involved with, you know, with some pretty serious academics. And um, one of the things that I stumbled across was that there's a correlation between energy consumption 
and GDP. I think to understand um, the nature of energy is that it is the ability to do work. That's the way the science of physics defines right. energy. It's the ability to do work. And so everything we do requires energy. And our GDP is the output of the work that we do. So there is, when you graph the, when you graph GDP against the consumption of energy over time, you find that they virtually track identically within less than 1% deviation. Yeah. So um, the thing is, is that we're at a, we're at a, a critical point now where we're, we're, we're obligated due to climate change and also resource depletion to change the paradigm of what we do, where we source our energy. And are we going to be able to have the same amount of energy using what we consider renewable energy as compared to fossil fuels? And that's going to be a stretch in not just my opinion, but the opinion of, of of, of many learned experts. So while we're uh, planning this show, there's actually a plan for this show, believe it or not. Um, I know. <laughs> we, we talked about our extractive um, economy and how it's always going to be bigger, faster, better, uh, and growth, constant growth. I mean, if you're a publicly traded company and you're not growing every year, year on year, your stock goes down. Um, is that is that a sustainable uh, economy, uh, Peter? Is that a sustainable uh, uh, business model? Uh, you know, I'm not an economist. <laughs> I just play one on TV. No, um, Marcus Welby. Sorry about that. Anyhow, um, it doesn't seem sustainable to me. My what I've everywhere else that I know of where you have rampant or continuous growth. It's a given, you know, it's usually in a medical sense and it's called cancer. Um, it is, you know, life has ups and downs. It, it has contractions and expansions. And the theory that we can grow our population and our economy and that there's enough stuff to allow us to continue doing that infinitely, I think has been um, one of the great feats of, uh, of storytelling you know, in our, in our civilization, in our society. So if our energy supply starts contracting, what's gonna happen? According um, to your graph, our economy will be going down, correct? Yeah, I, I think that's a fair assumption. Less energy, less productivity, less products, uh, less stuff. And, you know, you know, so I see human behavior as being um, something that is that we need to worry about because people have been told and taught that continuous growth is the way to be. It's the right way. It's it's what we can expect. It's what we should have, and we're entitled to all this. And I just don't see. <clears throat> excuse me. I don't see how it how how that can continue happening, um, especially as um, we stop using or start use less fossil fuels. I mean, an example, I mean, the concentration of energy that's in, in fossil fuels is unequal to anywhere else in, uh, in, in nature. Um, you know, for instance, there's 12,500 kilowatt hours of energy in a cubic meter of petroleum. Right. That's an enormous amount of power. And it's in a very small, very portable um, form. So you can use it. You, it's easy for transportation. It's very difficult to, to, to run a, a tractor trailer or um, a transoceanic freighter on windmills or solar panels. Right. And it's been, and relatively, to... it's been relatively easy to get. When, when you look at the the supply chain for getting that gallon of gas to our gas station here in Kaneohe or over there in Dilo. Yeah. You know, if it starts out, let's say Saudi Arabia and it flows out of the ground, they've got to run it to the ship, load it on the ship. 
Then the ship's got to come about three or 4,000 miles to get here. And then it goes into a refinery. And then uh, from the refinery, it goes into a truck and then it's distributed. And everybody's got to have a little piece of the action all, all along the supply chain. They've all got to get a little bit of a profit out of it. Otherwise, they are not in business. Yet, we can still deliver a gallon of gasoline up until like a month ago for about three or four dollars a gallon. Right. That's pretty unbelievable. If you look at the calories or the, the output energy of, of human labor, um, a gallon of gasoline has about four and a half years of human labor wrapped up inside oh, of it. That's a great so at the point you can get that for four dollars after all the processing is really remarkable. I mean, it's like it, it's been free, free labor. I mean, so I, yeah, it, I, I wanted to make the analogy that that petroleum replaced the free labor we had up until its discovery, the human right. free labor that we had. And just to give you an example, like let's throw up the next slide, which talks about oil tankers getting that uh, petroleum from Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, here. It's incredible that, you know, you got 100 million barrels of oil per day arriving on, you know, or being distributed around the world every day. We had a great slide, which we couldn't use because of copyright issues uh, that showed the number of tankers at sea. And it was unbelievable as a Thousands. Sub yeah, as an ex-submarine guy, I was saying, wow, look at all those great targets, you know. But uh, 100 million gallons of oil a day is a lot of, uh, a lot of oil that we have to displace. Um, so I kind of wrote a couple of little notes down. Do we really have a problem? I, I wrote to myself, I mean, everything seems okay to me. I can drive my car. I can have my hot shower. I can run my computer. Everything seems to be pretty good. So, gee, is the sky really falling? Exponential growth is one of those things where everything seems fine until it's not. And like um, one of the people that I interviewed for a documentary that I, that I made uh, a number of years ago, a guy named Do uh, Dr. Albert Bartlett, who was a physics professor at, at uh, the University of Colorado. He put together an, a really amazing um, video of just basically talking about exponent, exponential growth. And one of the examples he used was, if you have a container, and, and this is a mind problem, so if you have a container and the rules are, is that you, you put in a, a thing and you double it once every minute, and at minute zero, it's empty, and at minute 60, it's full, how many minutes have elapsed when it's half empty? Oh. <laughs> 59. Oh, OK. At yeah. 58 minutes, it's three quarters empty. Right. If you if you add three more containers, how much additional time? So if you have three more Earths, let's say Earth is that container. If you add three more Earths, how much time do you additional time do you have? Two minutes. Right. So we're at a point now, for example, I mean, if it. If we can go to the uh, the human population growth, I mean, this is probably a good time to bring that slide. Yeah, in. let's have that next slide up. Slide five. There you go. So, when when my father was born in in 1922, the population of the entire planet was 1.9 billion people, and it took the Homo sapien, our species, 300,000 years to grow to that point. Right. In 100 years, we've added another 6 billion people, all of whom want to live like Americans, all of whom want to live like Western society, all of whom want to consume. And our economy wants to deliver all that stuff to them. Right. And there is no notion that mm, we might not be able to do that. So, so oh, sorry. No, that was that's it. Well, the other factor that came into that, I mean, why, how, how are we able to support an additional six billion people? Well, it was the development of um, fertilizers, ammonia, which made the land four, t four times more fertile than it was before in the early 1900s. 
And so, I mean, I think they developed uh, ammonia around 1922 in that, that, that era. And that just allowed food production to basically explode ex exponentially. Yeah, fossil so fuel. Yeah, fossil fuels enabled that. I mean, it's not just yeah. it, and, and and fertilizers are wholly dependent on fossil fuels. Um, but you have all the machinery that you use for farming and for transporting and the centralized production that you have, um, and the factory farming. All of that is dependent on fossil fuels. We're in a situation now where everything has to be transported. And ninth, even today, what I mean, I have an electric car, I have solar panels. Even today, with um, with the, the vast expansion in or our perception that it's expanded a lot, um, electrifying transportation, 96% of global transportation still relies on fossil fuel. Yeah, another interesting fact, you know, with this Ukrainian war going on is I the number I heard was like 75% of the ammonia is produced by Russia. So here we are, you know, you know, shutting them down. So they're gonna, you know, shutting down the, the ammonia that's gonna affect our food supply. Um, yep. So this is a kind of a really interesting time uh, we're going through right now because that, that war has really woken a lot of people up about the fact that, gee, maybe it isn't as great as we thought. Maybe the lights aren't going to go on. Uh, we're going to have a blackout because we can't get enough natural gas uh, in our system. Yeah, so, Russia is Russia is also the, I mean, it kind of goes back and forth over the last few years, where it's been going back and forth between Russia and the United States being the largest oil producers in the world. The United States has achieved that due to its due to uh, the development of or the uh, fracking, basically shale oil. Um, and that those, those people who, who track oil production, conventional oil production peaked in 2018. And all of the increases in the years in the last four years um, to the global market for petroleum have come from US fracking. The thing about fracking is that it is very short lived. You, you drill a, a productive well, and within, within two years or two and a half or three years, it's producing half the volume it, it did when it first started out. Yeah. So um, you know, looking, at, looking at the well count on a daily basis, I mean, we're, we're basically at a standstill right now in terms of being able to increase the amount of petroleum there is to move the global economy from one end of the planet to the other. Um, so it's it's a very it's a very mixed bag because we have this global economy, and we want to transition away from fossil fuels, but just to get the solar panels from China to the United States, you got to all of this involves fossil fuels for transportation, for mining the natural resources. For it's it's still all wholly dependent on it, and and looking at the sun as a renewable energy that looks at the source of energy. It doesn't look at the unified system. And the system, the whole system, they, I mean, essentially, I, I'm very comfortable saying there is no renewable energy today without fossil fuels, which is really a conundrum to deal with. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Let's drop the uh, next slide, slide six, which talks about recoverable oil. Right. So there's um, there's a, a an energy analytical company in Norway called Reisted Energy, and um, they pull together the three major um, oil uh, or or energy assessments each year, which are put out by the United States government, the, the EIA, the international. Excuse me, there's a freaking fly, pardon me, fly flying in my face. Um, the International Energy Agency and the BP Statistical Review, which is, comes from British Petroleum, and they gather all this data, and then Reisted takes and it parses all that and interprets what they've said. And in in July of last year, they made an incredible statement, which was that the recoverable oil, not the oil we're using, but what we know is still there to be recovered, contracted by nine percent in one year. Right. And they're forecasting that. By 2050, 
the flow rate of petroleum will be less than half of what it is today. So if you look at energy consumption, and especially how much is dependent on transportation, liquid fuels, having half of what we have today is going to have an impact on the scale of the global economy and the global economy and all of the people and all the wise people who have been who have been going grow 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 are going to have to re rethink their their assumptions right. so uh, let's uh, the other factor is the critical raw materials so let's uh, pull up the critical raw materials slide so i mean uh, they're, they're not finite yeah they're finite resources too right um, so, so you have um, you have raw materials like cobalt and lithium and nickel and you know some some very subtle um, you know, a very rare earth metals that are all essential to producing um, the systems that provide us with what we call renewable energy today our solar systems and our wind systems and. The rate at which we're mining these um, is, is, is at a staggering rate of consumption. Um, there are reports that have been put out in Europe um, where they're estimating that the ability to produce batteries, for instance, to mm -hmm. replace internal combustion engines for light duty vehicles can be done one time. In terms yeah, of producing that, let's batteries. look at the next slide as well because it kind of really illustrates what you're talking yeah. about. Thank you. So, what we have is we have a situation where the slide on the left, this uh, um, where in blue, what you have is you have the known global reserves, and then in yellow, what you have is the amount needed to phase out fossil fuel use in light duty vehicles, which is cars, buses, vans, delivery trucks, motorcycles, et cetera. So the, the thing is, is if you look at cobalt, there's not enough cobalt to do that one time to replace that. And these batteries only last, if you're lucky, 10 to 15 years. So what do you do after 15 years? Where do those replacement right. batteries? We'll have a new technology by them at scale. Maybe, maybe okay. not. Can you recover them easily? No. We don't have a. Everything has to happen at a massive scale. Right. I mean, you might be able to do it in a laboratory, and it may, you know, you may be able to have technology that's feasible. But getting out of the lab and into the marketplace at scale is an enormous problem, and all of that is going to be dependent on the same critical raw materials yeah. that these these systems are. So yes, recycling is going to have to be part of it. But once you, I mean, the, the slide on the, on the right takes a look at a scenario where we're, we're now we're talking about solar and wind systems that have, that have battery backup, that have battery right. storage, power storage. And, and the ability to do that, it, it, it becomes impossible. We can't even do that one time. Right. To replace the existing fossil fuel power generation. And that doesn't even begin to deal with industrials industrial scale transportation. So spaceship earth, we have, we have a problem. And the thing is, is that the solutions that we're using now have been, we've been told that this, is, that this isn't a stepping stone, this is a solution. And I personally, I question that. Right. Yeah, if you look at what it takes to recycle batteries, and we're not just, like you said, it's not just like on a lab where you can take it apart slowly. You have massive, tons and tons of batteries coming in. First of all, some of them are charged, some of them are not. So if they're charged, they've got electricity in them and they could be dangerous. So you've got to bust them up and grind them up and you've got all this uh, potential electricity floating around. You've got acids. You've got a whole variety of materials and it's not, uh, it's not obvious how you're going to be able to recover that. now. I've heard also read that some manufacturers are developing new batteries like lithium ferrophosphate batteries that are solid state and uh, are claiming that they can uh, recycle up to 99% of the lithium. So that's uh, out of yeah. Quebec. Uh, Hydro Quebec has got a battery that can do that. There's a, there's a, um, 
a scientist that came out of Tesla who has who has now left Tesla and has started a recycling company to recycle batteries of all, all different kinds. Right. And it's it's really impressive what he's done because like you said, he's able to, he, he's got a pipeline, he's got a production pipeline that could be scaled. But but when we say could be scaled, it, it I can't, I can't, um, I can't picture how big the scale is right. for dealing with this on a global basis. So, and, and the thing that, I mean, the great equalizer in all this is time. How fast can you do it? It's not like we have, it's not like we have forever and we can just sort of amble our way into, into getting this done because as we, you know, as Rice Dad was saying, the transportation, the liquid fuels are simply not going to be available in 20 years right. at the scale that we're dealing with now. So, um, and if we, you know, if we don't find ways to recycle or um, dispose of it properly, what's going to happen? It's going to end up in the landfill or somebody's just going to dump it and eventually get into our groundwater supply. And, you know, heavy metals and groundwater isn't a very good thing either. So, right. Yeah, there's, so there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, issues that have to be solved. So we do have a problem in Spaceship Earth, yes, and there do. is no Planet B, Plan B, Planet B that we can just oh well, let's just dump this planet and let it uh, sit around for a couple million years and regrow the trees and get better, and we're gonna go off to this other planet and do the same thing. So that that's yeah. not gonna work. We have to change the stories we tell ourselves. We have to want different things. There has to be a different metric for being happy, for bringing right. happiness to ourselves. Yeah. We can do this, but we have to know that that's part of it. Yeah, we can't just be consumer, consume, consume, throw away, throw away, throw away, dig more. You know, we have to be really smart about it. So I want to throw up the last slide, which is. Uh, about 25 years ago, I was working for a company in Florida and we, we produced a little brochure and this was the end message on it. Uh, basically, our world is fragile. Our future energy needs are great. It's time for those of political power and financial strength to make a difference. And so in our follow-on episodes, as we go forward with this, Peter, uh, we want to uh, look at what are some good plans that people of uh, political power and financial strength can do to make a difference, because that's what it's gonna take. It's gonna take a combination of good policy and finance and the money to do it. Like if I look here in Hawaii, I don't see the big dollars. You know, We wanna be 100% this and 100% that by 2035 or 2045. Like you said, it's got to be at massive scale, and I don't see massive resources like money, which is the the engine being put where our money money where our mouth is. So that's why we need to have this kind of a shift. This is why we need this kind of a conversation. That's why we need to get our political elite on board. And we need, you know, we've got a lot of very wealthy people here in in uh, Hawaii. They come out here to. You know, to retire, I hate that word retire, but they're, they're coming out here and they can really help us here in Hawaii, Spaceship Hawaii. And we can show an example for everybody else. So final comments from you, Peter, before we dial out. Uh, well, I, I, I'm thinking that, uh, that probably the, the most renewable, sustainable, um, source of energy I know of in terms of making both transportation fuel and um, and electricity is, and we're very lucky here in Hawaii, is geothermal energy. And that's something that is that theoretically could be available anywhere on the planet. You just have to drill deep enough. And it's really, it, you know, so we, we can talk about that um, as, you know, in the, in the next shows, but it certainly here, it is an option for us to minimize or to mitigate the, uh, the degree of impact that the inevitable change will be having. Absolutely, we're gonna talk about that in our follow-on show because that's definitely a gift that we need to utilize. Otherwise, 
it's not going to be as business as usual. It's like you said, you know, it's like the nine, we're at the 96% point, you know, we, we haven't got that much time. We've got to, we got to get off the dime and get going. So thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Peter, for My helping pleasure. us put this show together in the series and, and using your enthusiasm and great, uh, and, and, and great communication skills to help us out on, on this path. So I'm going to leave it there. And we've been watching Hawaii, the state of clean energy on Think Tech Hawaii. And today we've been talking story about Spaceship Earth and our broken sustainability system with Peter Sternlight, who shares insights. And in our follow on shows, we'll be discussing solutions. It's not all problems. We've got to have solutions. So thank you, Peter. My pleasure. And aloha. And thanks to our viewers for tuning in. And I'm Mitch Ewan. We'll be back in two weeks with another edition of Hawaii the state of clean energy. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.